one of the benefits of history is that uh, we can speak more easily with perspective about events that were 50 or 100 years ago than events that are 50 or 100 days ago, um, is that the the current wave of political violence, and obviously January 6th is is sort of in a class by itself here, but we've seen you know comparable uh, episodes, you know the 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 attempt to 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 assassinate Governor Whitmer in uh, in Michigan, some of the really ugly examples of Antifa protests on the left in Portland, uh, Oregon, and and Seattle. They seem to be closer to the political mainstream uh, than certainly groups like the Weathermen or, or, or SLA um, uh, does, and you know whether that's a result of of a political culture in which um, you know threats of violence seem to be routine, whether it's a result of social media, or whether it's this kind of temporary blip like the '70s violence that will then go away, I think is the big unanswered question for um, for this aspect of American politics over the next decade or so. Hello, everyone, and welcome. On behalf of Revolutionary Spaces, Ford Hall Forum, and the GBH Forum Network, I want to thank you for joining this evening's program, The Liberty Tree Flag and the Spirit of American Protest. I'm Nat Shidley, the president of Revolutionary Spaces, and I will be your host this evening. Our organization's mission is to bring people together today on Zoom uh, to explore our nation's unfinished struggle to create and sustain a free society as evoked by the two national treasures that we care for, the Old State House and Old South Meeting House. This year, we're commemorating the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party, which began at Old South Meeting House with a series of public meetings leading up to that night on December 16, 1773. And we're using this seminal moment in our founding story as an invitation for all of us to consider the vital role of protest in a free society. Tonight's program is an important part of this arc of dialogue. We are delighted to be joined this evening by two amazing institutional partners in presenting this program. The WGBH Forum Network is a public media service of WGBH that collects thousands of video and audio lectures from the world's foremost scholars, authors, artists, scientists, policymakers, and community leaders made available online to the public for free. The Ford Hall Forum is the nation's oldest continuously operating free public lecture series. Its mission is to foster an informed and effective citizenry and to promote freedom of speech through public presentation of events like this evening's exploration of the history of protest in America. We are grateful to our friends at both the Forum Network and um, Fort Hall Forum for making tonight's program possible. And on behalf of all three partners, Revolutionary Spaces would like to thank the Lowell Institute for their generous support of free public programs like this one throughout the year. If you'd like to help support Revolutionary Spaces and programs like this, I hope you'll consider becoming a member by giving a gift in any amount that is meaningful to you. As we begin, I do want to take one moment to acknowledge on behalf of Revolutionary Spaces and our partners, that the sites that our organization cares for, the Old South Meeting House and the Old State House, stand on the occupied, still unceded homeland of the Massachusetts people. We honor and respect the many Native peoples who are connected to this place, past, present, and future, including the Nipmuc, Massachusetts, and Wampanoag peoples. Revolutionary Spaces supports our Native neighbors, and is committed to understanding and dismantling the destructive legacies of settler colonialism that are embodied in the histories of our buildings. In tonight's program, we unearth a unique treasure from our expansive collection, the iconic Liberty Tree flag. We will consider the history and the materiality of this amazing object, which has come down to us across more than 250 years, and use it as a lens through which to view and explore the great American tradition of protest. Revolutionary Space's Associate Director of Collections, Lori Erickson, will showcase the Liberty Tree flag and discuss the artifact, which was used to mark the Liberty Tree as a site of memory after the first protest that happened there in 1765, um, a protest against the Stamp Act. Um, and the Liberty Tree came to be symbolized as a, as a, as a, as a, as a site for 
understanding the power of protest. Almost every popular protest that took place in revolutionary Boston after August 1765 genuflected in some way to the Liberty Tree. And later the flag was brought out at anti-slavery meetings and feminist meetings during the 19th century as a reminder of the power of protest to make change. We'll then be joined by award-winning scholar and professor of history at Brooklyn College and the City University of New York Graduate Center, Robert David Casey Johnson, who will take us on a journey through the history of American protest movements from the colonial era all the way up to the present day. The program will conclude with, I hope, ample time for discussion and for questions from all of you in the audience this evening. So please take advantage of the opportunity to share your questions as they come to you. Um, you can use the, the Q&A function on Zoom this evening um, to share your questions with us. Um, and uh, I'm just honored and delighted to have all of you here with us this evening. So this time I'd like to invite Lori to join me um, and I will invite her to tell us a little bit about the flag, Lori. Great, yeah, um, thank you, Nat. I'm very pleased to be here to share with you one of the many treasures from the Revolutionary Spaces Collection. Um, could we get our first slide, please? Uh, so this object, which has been called both the Liberty Tree Flag and the Sons of Liberty Flag, was donated to the Bostonian Society in 1893 by a gentleman named John C. Fernald. Um, beginning with the organization's founding in the 1880s, the Bostonian Society um, would publish annual proceedings. And in, this donation was mentioned in the 1894 volume, um, and it was described as the flag which waved from the old Liberty Tree in 1775. Um, typically for these programs, I would be holding the item, uh, but in this case, the flag, as you can probably guess from looking at this picture, is um, very large, too large to, and fragile to be handled at this point. Um, when unfurled, it is seven feet by 13 feet, um, so it is pretty big. So I'll just be sharing a few photos of it instead. Um, but I think this is actually a better way to see it anyway, because you can see the entire flag and you can understand, um, better understand the scale of it. Um, so this image of the flag was taken when it was at a lab for analysis about 15 years ago. You may notice the darker squares, some little dark patches on there and in different places. And those are spots where the flag has been patched over the years. Um, but before I go in talking to too much talking too much about the flag, um, I wanted to give you a little background about what the Liberty Tree was. Um, so probably the earliest mention of the Liberty Tree appears in Boston newspapers in 1765. And at that time, the tree was already around 120 years old um, and was documented as having been planted in 1646. It was a pretty recognizable landmark to uh, most of the residents. It was located on the only road out of town um, since Boston was still connected by a single neck of land at that time. And the land around the tree was still fairly open um, with more of a suburban feel to the area, making it a good gathering spot for large groups of people. So in 1765, the British government had instituted a tax called the Stamp Act on the American colonists. Um, this required all legal documents and written materials. So basically anything that was printed on paper um, to carry a tax stamp. So pretty much anything written was taxed and that applied to a massive amount of materials. Um, so the col colonists were uh, rightly outraged by what they perceived as an un unfair and excessive tax. And they also felt that um, the British government should not be taxing them, that only the colonial legislature should be taxing the colonists. So as a result, a group of business owners calling themselves the Loyal Nine began meeting to plan protests against the Stamp Act. Um, and one of their gathering spots became this large elm tree that was located in what was then called Hanover Square um, near the intersection of Orange and Essex streets. Uh, and for reference, Orange Street uh, later became Washington Street and in modern times, this would be at the corner of Washington and Essex um, in Chinatown. So in August 1765, the Loyal Nine organized a protest against the Stamp Act 
um, at the Elm, and it ended up involving hundreds of Bostonians. Um, they hung an effigy of the tax agent from the tree, um, and then they marched to the agent's house and office and uh, um, were basically vandalizing the properties, um, as well as stomping and burning the effigy. Uh, a few weeks later, after that event, the Loyal Nine then attached a copper plate to the tree um, with the words, the Tree of Liberty, and the Liberty Tree was born. Um, they also began to call the ground below the tree Liberty Hall in honor of its use as a public gathering space. Over time, the Loyal Nine group grew even larger and they eventually adopted um, the name of the Sons of Liberty. So in addition to using the tree as a meeting place, the Sons of Liberty also had a secret room that was um, right across the street from the tree at a distillery. And uh, there was a quote from John Adams who had visited there on January 14th, 1766 and said, spent the evening with the Sons of Liberty at their own apartment in Hanover Square near the Tree of Liberty. Um, so the possible first mention of flags flying from the Liberty Tree came from the Boston Evening Post on September 16th, 1765, when it was noted that the great elms on the south side of town, quote, were decorated with the ensigns of loyalty and the colors embroidered with several mottos. Uh, this was the same account where they also mentioned the copper plate being affixed to the tree and the celebration was occurring in response to the, the resignation of the tamps, tax stamp distributor um, as a result of the colonist protests. So over the following years, a number of other protests and celebrations took place at the tree. Um, there were numerous references in newspapers at the time to flags and banners being flown from either the tree itself or a pole that extended up through the tree. Um, in many cases, it was reported that the British flag, also referred to as the colors, um, was being flown from the tree. Uh, next slide, please. Some accounts mentioned that the tree was literally festooned with many individual streamers or flags. Um, lanterns were also sometimes hung throughout the trees, um, which gave it this beautiful look, and that was usually done for celebrations. Um, this 18th century woodcut shows the tree displayed with a variety of flags and banners just to give an idea of how, to, how it might have looked with uh, many trees and uh, banners, many flags and banners on it. Um, so a description of the Stamp Act repeal celebrations in 1766 reads, as soon as it grew light enough to see the steeple of the meeting house next to the Tree of Liberty was hung with banners. The tree decorated with flags and streamers and all around the town on the tops of houses were displayed colors and pendants. Um, so that basically was like the beginning point of these big celebrations that, um, you know, it would be decorated and many of the other houses, surrounding houses around would be decorated as well. Um, there were also instances when it appears that just a single flag was flown, such as a June 1768 account of uh, Governor Francis Bernard, who wrote, in August last, just before the commencement of the present troubles, they erected a flagstaff which went through the tree and a good deal above the top of the tree. Upon this, they hoist a flag as a signal for the Sons of Liberty, as they are called. So the general impression from a lot of these accounts is that there was not just one flag used on the Liberty Tree, but any number of flags and banners could often be seen there. Um, finally, after a decade, about a decade of serving as a rallying point for the Sons of Liberty, not to mention standing as a potent symbol for um, the fight against oppression, the British, some British soldiers actually cut the Liberty Tree down um, in August of 1775. And so that then brings us to what happened to this particular, particular flag, the flag that was uh, purported to have been used on the Liberty Tree in the 1770s and that came to the Bostonian Society. Um, we don't have any information about how he came into possession of the flag, but at some point following the destruction of the tree, 
We know the flag was in the possession of a local wire, wire worker by the name of Samuel Adams. And this was not the statesman Samuel Adams, but a man who went by the nickname of Rat Trap Adams, apparently because he was so good at fashioning wire rat traps. <laughs> um, so Rat Trap Adams was said to have served both in the Rev Revolutionary War and in the War of 1812. Um, he claimed to have been one of the so-called Boston boys who were um, the young men who would guard the secret rooms where the Sons of Liberty would meet, um, stand kind of as a sentinel for those rooms, those meetings. Um, in his 90s, he was celebrated as being one of the last Revolutionary War soldiers in Boston. And he was born in 1759, um, so he would have been a teen teenager at the beginning of the war. Um, and when he died in 1855 at age 96, it was noted in the New England Historical and Genealog Genealogical Record um, that he had once owned a flag that was used on the Liberty Pole um, near Essex Street at the beginning of the revolution. So it was well known throughout town that he owned this flag. Um, he was said to have exhibited it around Boston for years afterwards, including bringing it to meetings of abolitionists and women's groups um, as a symbol of the ways in which protests can really make change in society. Um, there's also a reference in Samuel Gardner Drake's 1856 volume, History and Antiquities of Boston, um, describing Adam's flag as one of the flags with which the Liberty Tree used to be decorated. Um, the flag then is included in Adam's will um, which he left to his daughter, who was married to William Fenno, the proprietor of the Federal Street Coffee House. Um, the Fennos then in turn passed the flag down to their daughter, who married Daniel Carlton, who was a shoemaker um, or shoe dealer on Hanover Street. And when Carlton died, he then gave it to John C. Fernald, who was uh, a local grocer, and he was the donor he gave, who gave it to the Bostonian Society in 1893. Uh, prior to donating the flag, Fernald had loaned it for various exhibits, including the World's Columbian Exposition, Exposition of the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, um, where it was used in a colonial, an American colonial exhibit. Um, next, so, next slide, please. So this is an image of the flag on display at the Bostonian Society in 1936. This is from a story that was done in uh, the National Geographic magazine. And as I mentioned, the flag is quite large. It measures seven by 13 feet. Um, it's made of nine stripes total. There are five red, five red and four white, and um, each stripe is an individual piece of fabric that is um, hemmed on the sides, and then each of those were um, sewn together to make the flag that you see here. Um, it's constructed of a woven wool, wool bunting, uh, which was a common flag material in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and the seams are all hand sewn with linen thread. A lot of the actual original linen thread um, is still in existence on the flag. So chemical analysis was done um, when it, it was in the lab and the red dye was found to be matter, which is M-A-D-D-E-R which is a root um, that was used as early as 3,500 years ago um, as a red dye. And it was common up until the early 19th century, um, at which point synthetic dyes were developed and replaced most of the natural dyes. Um, the matter plant grows around the world, including North America. So it was a pretty common um, dye that was used by both indigenous peoples and uh, colonial settlers. It really produces a very like surprisingly vivid shade of red actually. Um, the 
the colors have probably faded somewhat over the years, but they're still pretty, pretty bright actually for a 250 year old flag. <laughs> Um, so there's not a lot of documentation about the flag in terms of how it looked originally um, or how it was displayed originally, how it was used on the, on the tree. Um, but some early references mention the, the flag, that this flag was part of the Liberty Tree flag or a Liberty Tree flag or a fragment of. Um, so it is possible that this is not the entire complete flag. Um, one thing that kind of uh, backs that up is the fact that there are two additional pieces that were given by the same donor to the Old South Meeting House, um, and they are the same material, one red and one white. Um, next slide, please. So when the flag was originally donated, it had this caption banner attached, which reads, 1775, the original Liberty Tree flag, which floated in the breeze on this spot. Um, which basically suggests that it must have flown again at some point at the original Liberty Tree location um, for some type of event. Um, we do know that Lafayette visited the stump of the Liberty Tree on his visit to Boston in 1825, so it could have been displayed at that celebration. Um, there is a record that Fernald had loaned it to the Old South Meeting House in 1876 for their centennial exhibition. So it's possible it could have been hung at the Liberty Tree site um, around that time for an event, or it may have been something that was totally unrelated. Um, the flag has no pocket or attachment, um, ribbons or um, strings or anything like that. So I personally think it seems unlikely that it would have been hoisted up a flagpole I think it's more likely that it may have been um, draped across the tree in some way, or that the individual stripes may have been individual banners, um, streamers at one point that were then later uh, sewn all together to make a bigger piece, a bigger flag. Um, but it's really hard to know without uh, very detailed descriptions of how it was used at the time. So um, it, it's also not really obvious how it was hung, whether it was uh, horizontally hung or vertically hung. So there's still a lot of mysteries about it, but um, it's always fun to discover more. And, um, you know, we're learning more and more about it every day with, uh, especially with some of these um, analyses that we're doing. So, uh, so that's most of what we know about this incredible object, the Liberty Tree flag, and I'm happy to answer any questions after the program, at the end of the program. Um, and now I will hand it back to Nat. Lori, thanks so much. Um, the Liberty Tree flag is an object that has fascinated me since I um, first came to the old state house uh, as a uh, historian um, and worked, started working with the collection back in 2011. Um, and it is, you're right, it is, it is uh, a, a piece that inspires the imagination, makes us want to know more, uh, but there are limits, obviously. Um, to what we can know. Uh, we've had a bunch of really interesting questions that have come in about the flag while you've been speaking and also about the Liberty Tree. Um, so I just want to let the audience know that we're um, we're tracking the questions and we'll have a chance to um, bring these back to Lori um, a little bit further along in the program. Um, but it, I, I want to um, I want to make a transition now to from this object, which um, is such an important emblem of the story of protest in revolutionary Boston to the larger story of protest in America. Um, and I think, you know, what Laurie was sharing with us about um, Samuel, the other Samuel Adams is helpful uh, to make that transition. And I, I want to call everybody's attention to the links in the chat um, to the old Bostonian Society blog, um, which uh, documents some of the research that our amazing intern, Catherine Griffith, who I think may actually be uh, in the audience for uh, this evening's program, um, that she conducted. Uh, she really unearthed a lot of the, um, the evidence about 
uh, Samuel Adams and his life and how he used the flag. Um, and yes, he did bring it to meetings of the Free Soil Party as a kind of emblem of Boston's radical tradition. Um, he uh, he brought it to the anniversary of uh, Thomas Paine's uh, birth. He um, And when he died, uh, Catherine was able to um, to find the will that he left. And he does document his intentions for the flag, which he calls, you know, the flag of yore that hung from uh, the Liberty Tree. And uh, his intention is for it to pass to uh, um, Abby Folsom, who was a, a radical feminist uh, who um, was well known in Boston at the time. So I think you know we've we've got this sense that he sees this as a as a marker of what protest is all about and the power of protest to make political change, and wants to see that tradition continue. Um, so at this point, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Johnson invite Casey to join us. Um, and and I just wanted to, to ask whether that resonates with you, Casey, to, to see this sort of uh, emblem from uh, that first protest in the revolutionary era as encapsulating the story of what protest can be in America. Um, I don't know how that sits and, with you. And I think also a reminder that this concept of, of a right to protest is, among many other factors, embedded within American history from, from the founding of the country and even before that. And so the, the tradition that, that I'm going to be talking about is one that is very much rooted not only in the object that we've just seen, but in the stories behind the uh, the object over time. That's great. Well, um, Casey, I'm really excited to hear what you have to say um, and grateful for your help in giving us some context for understanding this important object. So I'll I'll leave it in your hands now. Thank you. And and thanks to all of you who have joined the uh, the, the the webinar. I'm very uh, grateful. Um, so I do have some slides so we can call those up uh, now. So Nat, in his um, uh, transition presentation, was mentioning the uh, the, the idea of, of, of the the liberty tree and the concept of, of abolition and feminism. And that tied into a third party in the uh, 1840s called the Free Soil Party. But it was also very, very much um, the work of, of what was the hard luck political party in, in American history, a party called the Whig Party, which existed in the 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s, which very closely competed with the Democratic Party during those period. The, the races between the Whigs and the Democrats, if you add up the votes, basically they were they were just about even. But the Whigs had the, uh, the bad luck of winning two presidential elections and seeing their presidents die in office and be succeeded by vice presidents who were not terribly loyal to uh, uh, to Whig principles. That said, the 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 Whig Party is is a party that I think is very much in in some ways with us today in spirit and is very important in terms of the history of uh, of protest because there was a Whiggish concept of protest, the idea of using protest to highlight issues and and transform public opinion and accordingly um, uh, uh, change uh, government policy and. Abolition and feminism are two examples of that. You see on the screen here, John Quincy Adams, the uh, you know, former Massachusetts uh, uh, congressman, uh, the only president in American history who left the, the presidency and went on to, to higher service in the House of Representatives and had an extraordinary career in Congress pushing the idea of, uh, of abolition. And William Lloyd Garrison on the right, uh, again, using the idea of trying to rally the, uh, the public on behalf of, uh, of abolition. Uh, next slide, please. And within this Whiggish tradition, we also see the beginnings of the movement of uh, for women's suffrage in the 1840s. Uh, this is Elizabeth Cady Stanton on the left, um, and the, the photograph on the right is a celebration of the Seneca uh, Falls uh, Convention, 1848, a uh, very Whiggish uh, approach, the idea, again, of engaging the public focusing public's attention on a key uh, political issue, and then assuming that an altered public opinion would uh, would lead to concrete policy changes that expanded freedom um, and reflected the principles of uh, of liberty that were embedded uh, within uh, within the American Revolution. All that said, um, we do need to go back in time uh, a, a little, uh, a little bit to sort of understand the tension within American ideas of protest and freedom that are apparent, really from the from the start, um, uh, in terms of the foundation of the United States. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, and one example of that is these two uh, uh, pieces of text that I have here on the uh, the screen. I suspect that everyone who is uh, who is in the audience tonight can identify the text on the uh, on the left, which is an excerpt from the the First Amendment. Um, uh, what what Justice Jackson in the the famous uh, decision uh, uh, in, in the 1940s um, uh, uh, dealing with uh, the the right of of of, of school children not to be uh, compelled to uh, um, you know, to, to uh, uh, say pledge allegiance to the flag, uh, described as as the, the the fixed star of the American constellation uh, system, and you know so the sense of the United States as a country that respected the freedom of, of of speech as a necessary condition for effective political protest is something which is embedded within the Constitution, which very much reflects the revolutionary ethos that we see in uh, in you know, late colonial America um, and in revolutionary America between 1776 and 1787. However, on the right uh, is 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 some text that reflects, or at least seems to reflect, a very very different sort of uh, of principle. Um, uh, this is an excerpt from the Sedition Act of uh, of 1798, which is passed under the uh, administration of, of the Federalist President uh, John Adams, uh, voted uh, through in both houses of Congress by at least some of the same people who had supported the First Amendment um, as either members of the Federal Congress or state ratifying uh, conventions, less than a decade ago, and a law that exhibits a very, very different conception uh, of a right to uh, to protest um, and to engage in the political uh, process. You can read the text for yourself. It's pretty apparent from the, from the screen that the Sedition Act gave enormous powers to the federal government to clamp down on political protest in the name of national security with the goal of providing unity um, uh, to face a foreign threat. And as we're going to see, this is a pattern that uh, uh, recurs throughout American history in terms of suppressing an ostensible right to protest uh, uh, when we look at the uh, at the reality. Next slide, please. Probably the highest profile victim uh, of the Sedition Act was this man, Matthew Lyon, uh, L-Y-O-N, who was a Jeffersonian congressman uh, from uh, Vermont, um, is also the, the only American member of Congress to ever have been reelected from a jail cell. Um, he was charged under the Sedition Act, uh, convicted and sentenced to four months in, uh, in jail. Um, he came from a very strong Jeffersonian tradition. He was a sharp critic of the Adams administration. 1790s is a period of intense controversy between the political parties. The Jeffersonians were convinced that the Federalists were basically toadies of the British. The Federalists were convinced uh, that the, uh, the Jeffersonians wanted to turn the country over to the French. So there was intense dislike. I know it's difficult for all of us to imagine a political culture in which the two parties despise each other, but let's try to expand our minds and try to imagine such a situation. Um, this is the environment environment in which Lyon operated. And, and Lyon was, he, he he was not an easy person with whom to get along. He, you know, his, his critics would call him a demagogue, and perhaps that wasn't an incorrect, uh, uh, an incorrect uh, description. Um, but he was charged um, under the Sedition Act. Um, next slide, please. And he was charged for publishing uh, pieces that were simply critical of uh, of the Adams administration and Adams's approach to uh, to foreign policy. The document on the uh, on the left is is his own newspaper. When the local Vermont newspapers wouldn't publish his screeds, he established his own uh, publication called "The Scourge of Aristocracy," in which he criticized uh, uh, Adams. Um, after he got, got charged, uh, uh, Adams supporters in Vermont encouraged a local Vermont newspaper to publish a, a lengthy screed that had previously had been rejected that also uh, uh, criticized. This was classic political speech. You know, he was criticizing Adams for being pro-Britain, um, uh, uh, anti-democratic, but there was nothing seditious in it, nothing treasonous in it in any way. Um, but nonetheless, he was, uh, he was charged. And the Lion episode, it seems to me, is a quite significant one because it's a reminder that even the political culture that created the First Amendment was also 
also the same political culture that allowed for a sitting member of Congress to be sent to jail simply for criticizing the president of the United States and the president's policies. Um, the gap between the the uh, the rhetoric of of a, of a support for protest and the reality in the Lyon case was quite uh, was quite wide. Lyon, by the way, had a very very interesting subsequent career. He uh, he decamped from. Um, uh, uh, from Vermont to Kentucky, was was elected uh, to Congress uh, for several terms from Kentucky in the first decade of the 19th century, um, and then moved on from there to Arkansas and uh, narrowly missed being elected a territorial delegate uh, from uh, from Arkansas. Next slide, please. All right, so we have this. We have a couple of themes here. The first is a tension between uh, uh, the the idea of protest and the reality of politics, especially when it came to national security. And the second is this Whiggish conception of political protest as something that is embedded within the founding of uh, of the United States as a critical path for the production and the success of political reform. And the next era of significant political protest um, seems to me to embody both of these uh, these patterns, and that's the progressive era, which runs in the early 20th century, you know, roughly from uh, 1900, 1901 until uh, uh, 1919 or 1920. It is a period of enormous political and con uh, constitutional change. I have on the screen here um, the four constitutional amendments that are uh, associated with the progressive era, income tax, direct election of senators. Um, uh, prohibition, women's suffrage. It's, th it's the last period in American history in which the, there has been a significant wave of constitutional change. And one of the impetuses for that change is significant, effective, and widespread uh, popular uh, protests. That's especially true with regards to the 18th and 19th uh, Amendments, uh, prohibition and, uh, and women's suffrage. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the the suffrage movement, of course, had been around since before the uh, the Civil War. We saw the the episode of suffrage activists with uh, with Seneca Falls. There had been a hope um, in the aftermath of the Civil War that the constitutional change associated with Reconstruction would also bring equal political rights to uh, to women. But the Republican political administrations of of the time probably correctly sensed that a constitutional amendment that simultaneously granted uh, uh, the right to African Americans to vote and granted the rights of women to vote would be too controversial to gain acceptance. And so the 15th Amendment uh, prioritized uh, uh, the right to vote uh, only on the basis of, of color, although, as we all know with American history, uh, uh, Southern states and, and some other jurisdictions uh, uh, violated the amendment for, uh, uh, for decades. And so the suffrage movement moved on. It was relatively unsuccessful in the late uh, 19th century, but it picked up steam in in the early 20th century, in part by partnering with other protest movements, prohibition for one, which was very much a women's movement, the peace movement, which was in some ways at its high point at any period in American history in the 19 uh, teens, which was also seen as a women's movement. The idea was that women as mothers had a particular incentive to achieve peace to protect their uh, their sons. And also as more women go to college, um, the, the argument is that there's no justification for excluding them uh, from, uh, from political uh, life. And the suffrage movement targets in particular um, uh, President Wilson, who is seen as, on the one hand, a nominal progressive reformer, but on the other hand, someone who is, uh, who is uh, skeptical about the idea of meaningful uh, social reform. Um, by this point, most states in the West allowed women the right to vote. The critical question was whether Wilson and the Democratic Party were going to use their political clout uh, to get enough states uh, in the South and the Northeast on uh, on board. The photograph that we're seeing on the screen is a photo of uh, a photo of suffrage activists protesting a Wilson speech in Chicago uh, in the 1916 uh, presidential uh, election. Um, and next slide, please. 
This is a photograph, an even higher profile photograph that occurred uh, outside the gates of the White House that was organized by a new and more radical element of the suffrage movement called the National Women's Party, founded by Alice Paul, which directly targeted uh, Wilson. Um, and each of the, the women who were protesting outside of the, out, uh, the White House were wearing sashes to kind of mimic a beauty uh, uh, contest approach. But the sashes uh, uh, indicated the college or university from which they they, uh, from which they graduated. And the idea, you can see the, the slogan here, a linkage of the suffrage movement and the protests behind the suffrage movement to the concept of, uh, of liberty. This was an extraordinarily successful movement at uh, um, uh, at the end. Um, it, it, it successfully persuaded male politicians to broaden the electorate um, at a time when they uh, didn't necessarily have to uh, have to do so. But it also benefited, as I mentioned earlier, from partnership with other uh, movements. Uh, next slide, please. And among those was the prohibition uh, uh, movement. This is an it's, a, it's an interesting movement in a lot of respects, because I suspect most, maybe all of us, would associate the cause of prohibition and related uh, causes with social conservatism, and you know I think it's very much the the case in 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 subsequent U.S. history. And indeed, the prohibitionist uh, movement gets uh, strong support from more rural areas, um, uh, from more Christian areas that we associate with contemporary social uh, conservatism. But this is a movement that is born out of the grassroots, that is led by women. Um, whose most prominent organization, um, the Women's Christian Temperance uh, Union, is one of the largest protest groups in American history. It's headed by a savvy operator in Francis Willard. Um, and the WCTU argues that uh, a prohibition is a women's issue because women have a right to be protected from domestic violence. One of the core arguments that were made in prohibition protests is that men would, husbands would go off, get drunk in saloons and, and come back and hit their wives, but also that women had a right to look after their sons who would be sent into a dangerous world that was dominated by uh, by saloons. As with uh, the suffrage movement, the prohibition move movement is a it is a truly grassroots movement. It builds state by state support, in some case county by county support, outlawing the sale and dissemination of alcohol until it uses um, uh, the political climate of World War One to help push through a national um, uh, ban on the sale or dissemination of alcohol. Now, of course, after that, these two movements very much uh, uh, diverge. Uh, the prohibitionists ultimately get repudiated uh, with the 21st Amendment. Women's suffrage moves on to uh, to help uh, spawn a, a more uh, a broad-based uh, feminist uh, political movement. But in both cases, I think these are classic examples of political causes that reflect this Whiggish tradition that I was talking about earlier, using political protests and using the culture of liberty in the United States to force issues to to at least in, in the eyes of their supporters, expand freedom and to compel politicians to address the protesters' cause. And this is very much a characteristic, I think, of progressive era politics as, um, uh, as a whole. You see lots of experimentation at the state level to increase the power of, uh, of, of, of the people and to give uh, uh, the, the broader politi uh, uh, political culture um, an opportunity to insert themselves more on policy issues. That said, the progressive era is also associated with some of the most hardline striking attacks on the right to protest in American history. Next slide, please. The backdrop to this is the extremely peculiar politics of the presidential election of 2000, uh, of, excuse me, we're in the, we're in the 2000s, of 1916. Um, so in 1912, very interesting four-way contest between Woodrow Wilson, Theodore Roosevelt running as a progressive, the incumbent Republican William Howard Taft, and a socialist candidate, Eugene Debs, um, who attracted 6% of the vote despite running against these formidable politicians in his own right. And you can get a sense from this map of the county level of support for uh, Debs. Basically, there was almost no uh, support for the socialists in the South and very little support for the socialists in, uh, in the Northeast or the industrial Midwest. But in the rural Midwest, in 
the Rocky states in the far uh, west, the socialists had considerable support. And this was, you know, this was not a, a hard left uh, uh, um, uh, party. It's basically a, a, a more left wing vision of the of the progressive uh, uh, party. Um, in 1916, the Republican Party, which had divided in 1912, reunifies. It seems very likely that Wilson is going to lose. Um, and Wilson's political advisors come up with a plan. They look at the 6% of the socialist vote and they say, perhaps we can win by appealing to, um, uh, to these former socialists. Um, the socialists were, among other things, an anti-war party. Wilson runs in 1916 as a strongly anti-war candidate. Eugene Debs worried that uh, his his votes might throw the election to a pro-war Republican, chooses not to run. The socialists do nominate a candidate, but it's much weaker. And the result is, um, uh, is, is a quite surprising uh, map. Uh, next slide, please. Recall that socialist vote that we saw on the previous slide. The blue states are states that are carried by Woodrow Wilson in uh, in 1916. It's a very close uh, uh, matching. Historians are not supposed to make predictions, but I'll make one here. None of us are ever going to see a presidential uh, election map quite like this um, uh, again, at least any time in the in the foreseeable future. Um, Wilson, in particular picks up um, uh, the votes of anti-war socialists uh, in, in uh, former socialists in California and anti-war left wingers in in North Dakota and Nebraska where uh, anti-war Republican senators cross party lines to endorse Wilson so the sense here is that the peace movement which was very active in 1914 and especially in 15 and 16 had demonstrated its chops by basically turning an election that that should have gone on paper to the Republicans instead to the incumbent Woodrow Wilson. But we all know how this story ends. Uh, very shortly after being inaugurated for his second term, Wilson changes his mind as a result of changed international situations, brings the United States into the war, despite considerable opposition to the war in some parts of the country, especially the rural Midwest and the Rocky states, these st states uh, where, the, where the socialists previously were, um, were powerful. And as a result, Wilson chooses to throw the force of the federal government to attack anti-war protesters. Next slide, please. He does, though, so, uh, through two pieces of legislation, the Espionage Act of 1917, the Sedition Act of 1918, both of which essentially criminalize, criminalize political uh, speech if it's on behalf of an anti-war cause. And these laws are implemented. Next slide, please. Two of the highest profile examples, um, Charles Schenck. Um, uh, a, a New York socialist um, engaging in an act of classic political protest, handing out flyers to men who are about to be conscripted into the army, reminding them of what their legal rights are. He is charged uh, uh, under the Espionage Act. He is convicted. He, uh, with support from civil libertarians, appeals his case to the Supreme Court and in an infamous Supreme Court decision called Schenck versus the United States. The court upholds the law, saying that the government has the right to punish speech that constitutes a clear and present danger, an inherently vague standard that the opinion never quite uh, defines. To give an example of how this uh, this era can target uh, political protest. Next slide, please. We have the classic American political prisoner, prisoner Eugene Debs himself, um, who goes to Cincinnati, delivers an anti-war speech that essentially just spells out socialist thinking on uh, on on political um, uh, on the war, um, is arrested, is uh, criminally charged, is convicted, and is sentenced to a federal penitentiary in Atlanta. Indeed, he runs for president in 1920 um, from his jail cell. He won't be pardoned until Warren Harding in 1921. So we see a lot of the tensions with regards to political protest and speech during the progressive era. Next slide, please. These tensions are going to recur during the 1950s and 1960s in a variety of ways. The first is the emergence of political protest with the, with the clear purpose of, of preventing rather than expanding freedom, basically an anti-Whiggish uh, tradition. The photo we see on the, on the screen here is as uh, political protesters in Arkansas attempting to, uh, to stop integration. Next slide, please. 
And this photo that we're seeing is protesters in Oxford, Mississippi, uh, protesting the integration of the University of Mississippi um, and attempting to block the enrollment of James Meredith. This is a political crisis in the United States. It reaches the highest levels of, uh, of government. President Kennedy is frankly worried uh, that Meredith might be killed um, by this mob. He reaches out to the governor of, uh, of Mississippi, Ross Barnett, um, to, uh, to see if he can get Barnett's help in tamping down uh, these, uh, these dangerous protests. Um, let's take a listen to this uh, call uh, and we see how unhelpful uh, Barnett uh, was. Uh, next slide, please. Kind of consider moving Meredith as long as the, you know, there's a riot outside because he wouldn't be safe. Sir? We couldn't consider moving Meredith if, you, if we haven't been able to restore order outside. That's the problem, Governor. Well, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do, Mr. President. Yeah. I'll go up there myself. Well, now, how long will it take you to get there? And I'll get uh, a microphone and tell them that uh, you have agreed to, re to be removed. No, no, now, wait a minute. How long is, wait a minute, Governor. Now, how long is it going to take you to get up there? About an hour. Now, I tell you, if you want to go up there, you, then you call me from up there, and then we'll decide what we're going to do before you make any speeches about it. Well, all right. There's well, no sense in I there. Mean, whatever you, if you don't... You see, we don't, we got an hour to go, and that's not, uh, we may not have an hour. Uh, President, please, why don't you, uh, can't you give an order for her to remove me? How can I remove him, Governor, when there's a, a riot in the street, and he may step out of that building and something happened to him? I can't remove him under those conditions. As you can see, the governor was not particularly helpful. And this form of protest, we're all familiar with it, although the most prominent examples in the 50s and 60s are in the South. Uh, in the 70s, the most prominent example comes in Boston itself. Again, these counter protests opposing uh, school integration. That said, um, next slide, please. Um, the civil rights movement also effectively used uh, protest to galvanize uh, popular support. The March on Washington is one high profile example of this, but so too are the Birmingham peaceful protests of 1963, Birmingham chosen um, by Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Council because of a belief that um, uh, the, the the police would would react as we see on the screen, and that would engender sympathy for the civil rights uh, cause as uh, as a whole. Here we see you know attack dogs attacking uh, uh, peaceful protesters. Next slide, please. Uh, and here we see the uh, the the law enforcement uh, turning uh, fire hoses on peaceful protests. And in this respect, at least the southern um, uh, version of the of the civil rights movement is an is an example of this classic Whiggish pattern of peaceful political protest broadening discourse and and yielding change. Of course, there are real limits to this. When the civil rights protests move north, they're far less effective at changing hearts and uh, and minds. 1960s protests also show uh, limits when the protests deal with national security uh, matters as, uh, as a whole. Um, next slide, please. Probably the classic example of this are, are anti-war protests uh, with regards to uh, to the Vietnam War. On the one hand, this is an extraordinary wave of protest uh, activism. It culminates with the Moratorium Day protests of 1969. We see millions of Americans in a coordinated nationwide protest well before the era of social media uh, coming out to protest the war. That said, you know, at the end of the day, the United States goes into Vietnam. It's unclear how effective the protests uh, ultimately uh, ultimately were. There was, however, one interesting thing, I think, about uh, uh, anti-war protests in the 1960s, in that there was an explicit partnership between the protest movement and anti-war elements in Congress, hoping to use congressional power both to check the administration and to shape uh, a public opinion. In effect, Congress functioning as a protest vehicle itself. And maybe the best example of that were televised 1966 hearings dealing with the Vietnam War held in the Foreign Relations Committee, a committee that was chaired by J. William Fulbright, a critic of the war, and where several of the most prominent opponents of the war were members of the committee. And the, the, these hearings had such import because the administration witnesses struggled to deal with the you know, often informed and many times passionate questions from uh, uh, from the uh, uh, from the members, and a particularly telling exchange of that. Um, uh, next slide, please. 
Um, it's going to come on the next slide, this clip that we're going to play, which is an exchange between the Oregon Senator Wayne Morse um, and Maxwell uh, Taylor, uh, ambassador to South Vietnam. Well, now uh, we're engaged in a historic debate in this country. Our, we have honest differences of opinion. I happen to hold to the point of view that it isn't going to be too long before the American people, as a people, will repudiate our war in Southeast Asia. That, of course, and, is good news to Hanoi, Senator. Uh, oh, I, uh, I know that that's the smear artist that you militarists give to those of us that have honest differences of opinion with you, but I don't intend to get down in the gutter with you and uh, engage in that kind of debate, General. I'm simply saying that in my judgment, the President of the United States is already losing the people of this country by the millions in connection with his war in Southeast Asia. And all I'm asking is, if the people decide that this war should be stopped in Southeast Asia, are you going to take the position that's weakness on the home front in a democracy? I would feel that our people were badly misguided and did not understand the consequences of such a disaster. Well, uh, we agree on one thing, that they can be badly misguided, and you and the president, in my judgment, have been misguiding them for a long time in this war. This exchange in some way, and, and similar exchanges in some ways are a turning point in the, uh, in the history of the war, given that the administration struggles to defend itself. But as we're going to see from this next uh, clip, this is a contemporaneous conversation between uh, the uh, President Johnson and the then pro-war uh, Minnesota Senator Eugene McCarthy. Johnson doesn't really bow to the protest. Let's take a listen. What they, what they really think is we ought to be there and we ought to get out. Well, I know we ought to be there, but uh, uh, I can't get out. I just can't be the architect of uh, surrender. And uh, don't see, I'm trying every way in the world I can to find a way to uh, thing. But they, they don't have the pressure that will bring them to the table as of yet. We don't know whether they ever will. I'm willing to do damn near anything. If I told you what I was willing to do, I wouldn't have any program. Dirksen wouldn't give me a dollar to operate the war. I just can't, uh, can't uh, operate in a glass bowl with all these things. But uh, I'm willing to do nearly anything a human can do, if I can do it with any honor at all. But uh, uh, they started with me on Jim, you remember. Yeah. He was corrupt, and he ought to be killed. So we killed him. We all got together and got a goddamn bunch of thugs, and we went in and assassinated him. Now, we really had no political stability since then. It's an amazing clip in many uh, in many ways, but for our purposes for the for the forum tonight, it's a reminder that a national security matters. Oftentimes, presidents will simply dismiss protesters as not living in uh, in the reality of international relations. Ultimately, the U.S. does withdraw from Vietnam, but not under Johnson's presidency. Under Nixon, a man who is contemptuous of uh, of political protest as uh, as a whole. What about in the more modern uh, period? Uh, next slide, please. You know, if 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 we're thinking about contemporary um, uh, issues that reflect this this Whiggish tradition of political protest as expanding dialogue and ultimately leading to positive policy uh, change, probably the best example from the last fifty years is the movement for gay and lesbian equality. You can see the chart on the screen. This this focuses uh, exclusively on marriage, but an extraordinary shift in a relatively short time caused by one of the most successful grass roots uh, protest movements in uh, in American history. Um, there really isn't a comparable social movement that's exhibited this kind of shift in this uh, short a period of uh, of time. And you see the 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 pattern not just on uh, on marriage as a whole. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you see it on a variety of issues uh, of, uh, affecting uh, a whole array of uh, of equality for uh, for gay and lesbian uh, uh, Americans, um, you know, equal rights and jobs, um, uh, you know, the elimination of, of, of criminal penalties and the like. One of the ironies, however, of this is that um, the 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 need to go to the public and perform this kind of Whiggish, uh, 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 you know, route of political protest, was essentially imposed on the movement um, uh, for equality by its opponents. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, in the 1970s, um, uh, anti-gay activists of whom Anita Bryant is probably the uh, the the, you know, the highest profile example, recognized that they were ha- perhaps losing ground, um, if not with state legislatures, at least on the local level, and especially in courts where you know many of the arguments against uh, um, uh, equality didn't fare f- uh, uh, particularly well, and so they stimulated popular protests among grassroots, uh, mostly religious activists to restore tra- what they saw as traditional uh, morality. Next slide, please. Um, this is a protest against a, a, a Miami-Dade uh, statute that uh, that that called for um, uh, for workplace protections for for gays and lesbians in uh, in Miami. Um, this continued in a variety of movements to uh, to use popular protests to uh, uh, and, and plebiscites to reverse uh, um, uh, uh, sort of movement in 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 favor of equality. Uh, next slide, please. And it also created a basically unprecedented situation in which opponents of the right to marry for gay and lesbian couples were able to insert uh, state constitutional amendments at a time when public opinion was still hostile, thereby forcing uh, advocates of same-sex marriage to build an extraordinarily broad uh, popular movement to work in concert with the federal courts to uh, to restore uh, the right to uh, uh, to marry. Um, this is a vision of uh, of the movement that I, that I think is best reflected in in the work of Jonathan Rauch, who's, who's made the argument that the freedom of speech and the right to protest is critical in the United States um, uh, for the protection and promotion of the interests of marginalized groups. But the movement, I think, for for the uh, for the right to marry is you know it's a very wiggish movement. And although the the specific issue change, it harkens us back to this earlier uh, uh, time. That said, and to finish up, uh, I'm not sure that the the Whiggish protest movement is you know is is where things are in in contemporary uh, American politics. Uh, next slide, please. Obviously, the classic example of this is January sixth. Uh, you know, a, a, a protest uh, like no other over the course of U.S. Uh, of, of U.S. history, an assault on the foundation um, uh, of uh, of American liberty. Uh, next slide, please. But we've also seen this since 9-11 um, uh, with, with the Patriot Act and subsequent uh, uh, efforts to uh, sort of use the power of the state to penetrate uh, protest movements. And we've seen some movements also on the far left. The photo was, here was from an Antifa uh, uh, protest. Um, and uh, again, reflecting this idea of using protests to uh, uh, to shut down uh, dialogue, to impose opinions rather than to expand freedom. So as we you know, move into the uh, to put it hopefully as a new era, it is worth remembering that the spirit of the Liberty Tree is a spirit that often has served uh, Americans and has served this country uh, uh, very well. Uh, and with that, I hope people have lots of, uh, of interesting and engaged questions. Casey, thank you so much for that uh, valuable uh, tour through the long tradition of uh, American protests. I feel like I learned a huge amount, and I've got lots of questions. We've had some uh, some great questions come in, um, both about uh, your thoughts on protest and about the Liberty Tree. Um, I want to encourage audience members, if you have questions and you haven't yet had a chance to share them through the Q&A function, please do that. Uh, we would love to bring your questions forward for um, Casey and, and Lori to respond to. Um, I, I think maybe uh, I'd like to begin uh, with um, with this question, which came in from uh, from one of our audience members at the time of registration for the panel, but I think is really relevant, um, kind of as a kickoff to the conversation here, which is um, which is this: uh, Are protests ever palatable to the general population, and if so, how do we get there? Um, and I think what this is what this is really asking is: w- What are the conditions? in which it's possible for protesters to move public opinion. And, and Casey, you've given us quite a few examples, but I wonder if you can just step back and, and help us think sort of uh, synth, uh, sort of comprehensively, or what, what, do, what do the examples you've shared with us indicate about this and how might it help us think about the role of protest moving forward? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an excellent question. You know, I, I think there might be a handful of of common elements, at least in these successful um, uh, uh, protest movements. The the first is an is an ability to uh, you know to, to solicit allies as necessary. It's it, it's a kind of interesting counterfactual to imagine an American history in which the suffrage movement didn't coincide with the uh, with the prohibition movement, and to wonder maybe if that were the case, it might have been more difficult for each of them to uh, to go. This was a case where a partnership probably strengthened uh, uh, strengthened both. A second, and I think we see this in elements of of, of King's protests, but also especially in in some of the marriage uh, uh, protests in the uh, uh, you know in the same sex marriage fight, is a message of of, of inclusivity and celebration of liberty. You know, the, to, to me, the, the the hallmark of the Whiggish um, uh, tradition is a call for Americans to live up to the ideals of the country, not sort of a, a sense that the ideals of the country are inherently flawed. A recognition recognition that that our goal is always to create a more perfect union and we're never quite not we're never you know we're never quite going to get there but the goal is to get as as close as as possible because the goal of protests almost has to be to energize and to engage you know what political scientists called the movable middle, you know, people who who might be sympathetic to your cause, but don't care about it all that uh, all that much. And the successful movements that we've seen um, have have been able to kind of to kind of mobilize that. And if you think sort of in the in the more recent period, you know, a good example of of this would be the women's march uh, movement of of of, of you know the very early Trump years. You know these very broad-based movements, and you know it's, it seems like it was yesterday, but it's now six years ago. Um, and one of the most striking things to me about those movements was not that we saw large protests in New York or uh, you know Boston or San Francisco, which sort of would be expected because these were you know hotbeds of areas that were critical of uh, of Trump, but that we saw these large protests in Greenville, South Carolina, or in cities in Alaska. I remember the Alaska protesters. The the, uh, the protests were processing heavy snow, and they nonetheless uh, got out there. And these kinds of uh, of unifying messages often, I think, have been the most successful protest uh, movements uh, um, throughout American history, even though, you know, think of all of the movements that I've talked about. They're all engaged in an effort to significantly change American society, uh, but they're doing so in ways that that try to reach as wide a segment of the of the population as possible. Thanks, Casey. That's that's very interesting, um, Lori. Uh, I'm I'm not sure the the protesters under the Liberty Tree were thinking about finding unifying themes um, in in the protests um, in in Revolutionary Boston, but we have had quite a lot of questions um, that that are really trying to explore uh, some of the symbolism of the Liberty Tree and of the flag itself, and I, I want to make sure that we. Um, that we answer those. I, I know you've you've responded to most of them on the Q and A, but just um, in case folks haven't been following along there, uh, just to make sure that people are aware of the questions and and have a chance to hear your response. Um, uh, quite a few people actually asked about uh, the symbolism of red and white, um, and I will say, you know, uh, we we have sometimes wondered, given the stories attached to the Liberty Tree flying from the, I mean, the Liberty flag flying from the Liberty Tree well before uh, what we usually think of as the genesis of our national flag, it does make one wonder, uh, you know, what are what are the red and white standing for? And, and um, it, you know, should we be thinking about this as a first American flag? But what do we know, if anything, about why uh, red and white were chosen uh, as the colors for the bars? Yeah, um, I would say we probably know very little <laughs> about why those colors were used, but I think, you know, we can speculate that um, often the British flag was being flown on the tree. There are many, um, many references to the British flag or the colors being flown from that tree or around the tree. Um, and obviously red and white are very factor very strongly in that flag. Um, it's a red, white, and blue flag. Um, so there is a possibility that it was just, they were just pulling colors out of that flag and, you know, it was all just kind of around um, supporting that the uh, British governments and, you know, um, because really a lot of what was going on uh, with that tree at the time, um, most of the time leading up to the war, 
Um, it was really about loyalty um, to the government. And, you know, that's why the, the British flag was being flown. So um, my feeling is that it was probably more about just a reference to the British colors um, and that maybe those individual pieces may have been individual streamers at one time before they were put together into a flag. Um, so, you know, just sort of decorating and creating this like colorful display on the tree. There may have been blue streamers as well, and we just don't know. <laughs> um, they just didn't survive. So it's kind of difficult to know. I know that it does uh, somewhat resemble the um, British East, East, sorry, the British East India flag um, for the flag for that company, which had red and white stripes. Um, and that would have been a common thing to see at the time. So it could have also been somewhat based on that or just, you know, who knows, made of pieces of another flag or something. So um, it also, I know, as I mentioned with the dye, that red dye, it was a very easy dye to get. Um, I'm not sure the blue dye would have been as easy to come across. My understanding is that's not the case. So um, I think because they were able to access dyes that would have worked to create white and red um, fabrics, that could be another uh, possibility for why those were chosen. But, um, you know, and there may have been symbolism that we, we just don't know. And uh, was not recorded at the time, or at least hasn't been found yet. So it's kind of a mystery. <laughs> there were also some questions about the Liberty Tree as a symbol, um, and I'm not sure whether your research um, will allow you to uh, to weigh in on this. But, um, well, first of all, folks wanted to know um, what kind of tree the Liberty Tree was. We do know that, right? Right. So it was an elm, and it was part of a stand of... Uh, they were often referred to as great elms because I think they were just a bunch of very large elms in this area. Um, and that elm itself and possibly the others around it, um, there was documentation as to when it was actually planted. It was planted in 1646. So um, that tree was very well known. The age of it was very well known. Um, as I mentioned, it was right on the road going out of Boston. So it was a, a landmark that everyone would have known to meet at the Great Elm on the way out of Boston on Orange Street. So um, I'm sure that's why it was chosen. And, and there were also some questions about um, Liberty Trees in general and where the idea of a Liberty Tree comes from. Uh, and I, I'm I'm wondering was Boston's Liberty Tree the first because certainly there are others. I I had a very memorable uh, conversation with the um, uh, the third ranking member of government in Vietnam who made a visit to Boston several years ago, and um, I I walked through the old state house with him, and we we actually stood in front of the the case with the Liberty Tree flag and the lantern that later hung from the Liberty Tree, and talked about the Liberty Tree. And he said, "If you come to Vietnam, I want to show you our Liberty Tree because they also um, chose a, a Liberty Tree uh, during during their war for independence." Um, so the the idea spreads, but is it Boston that uh, is the genesis of the idea of a Liberty Tree, or does it have a longer history? you know? Um, my understanding is that Boston's Liberty, Liberty Tree was the first um, and that it then spread to other towns um, in New England, mostly. Uh, but yeah, as far as I know, it was the first one. There may have been, you know, other ideas around using trees in that way. But in terms of something called the Liberty Tree, I believe that Boston's was the first. Great. Casey, coming back to you, um, I want to make sure that we, there were some questions that were, I think, specific um, to the various examples that you shared and were questions that were sort of points of clarification or just trying to make sure that um, that folks were understanding the specific examples you were laying out there. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to Put some of those out there and and see what you what you can tell us. Um, so uh, there, somebody asked is whether the Sedition Act of 1918 is still in effect. 
Yeah, the, these laws are actually still on the books, and the, the highest profile recent example, the, uh, the the charges against Edward Snowden, uh, who you know, we all remember the, the former NSA contractor who um, absconded with with millions of documents, uh, released them to the media, and then went uh, then went off to Russia. Um, you know, he w- he would be charged under this law. Some of the leakers in both the Obama and Trump administration have been cha- uh, have been charged under uh, uh, you know under the Espionage Act at least in 1917. So this is, you know, it's, it's, it's one of, one of the, to me, troubling patterns of, of, of national security legislation is that uh, these laws get passed in periods of, of, of fear. Um, and then members of Congress are too afraid of repealing the, the laws, lest they get attacked for being insufficiently protective of, of national security. So they remain on the books, in this case, you know, more than a century after the, uh, the original cause, used in ways that probably even Woodrow Wilson never could have imagine them being uh, being used. Great. Um, and then there was a question about um, the uh, when you were talking about prohibition, um, you you talked a little bit about the the connection to preventing domestic violence. Um, and one of our audience members was uh, interested to hear a little bit more about that or any thoughts you might have about um, where they could go to learn more. Yeah, I think you know, one of the, the the fascinating things for me, and this this is something that 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 happens with my students when when I talk about this, when I cover this issue in my classes, is you know, we think of this for reasons that are that are quite understandable as a right wing movement because you know there it's a, it's a socially conservative uh, movement, but there is an explicitly gendered language with regards to uh, to prohibition, and you know the the specific although the specific phrase domestic violence is not used uh, with regards to the prohibition activists this is what they're what they're talking about the argument is that the state has to come in to protect women who are being subjected to violence from their husbands who are um, who are drunk, and you. Francis Willard, who, who never serves in public office, understands that this is going to be a message that will resonate with you know, with all women um, and through uh, all women, perhaps at least some uh, some men. So yeah, it's 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 an interesting and, and and oftentimes forgotten element of prohibition because we think of the failures of prohibition in the 1920s, you know, when when the when the uh, amendment proves to be un- unenforceable. Um, I just want to say our audience is on fire with questions right now. So keep them coming. This is fantastic. Uh, Lori, coming back to you um, with thanks, uh, Casey, for your response to that last question. Coming back to you, we've had some questions um, about uh, whether there are other liberty tree flags. So acknowledging that there were liberty trees in other places uh, on in other colonies. Um, do are there other liberty flags? Do we know of uh, of different flags for different colonies? Have any others survived like this one? Do you know? Um, there are no other flags that I know of, and certainly there could be something in a museum out there that we're just not aware of. But um, there's been quite a bit of research done over the years by Bostonian Society and now Revolutionary Spaces just to track down other liberty trees and other possible liberty tree flags. And um, so far, we have not been able to find anything else. So it's, you know, you can always hope that something is in someone's attic somewhere. <laughs> the fun of collections. You never know where new evidence will manifest itself, yeah, right? It could happen any day. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we we also we've had a couple of questions about whether there's a marker where the Liberty Tree stood. So can you clarify for people whether uh, they can go and find the spot and where it would be and what they would see if they were standing there? There is a pretty small little marker. I believe it's on the ground on the brick plaza um, where the Liberty Tree would have stood um, or close to there. And it's near the um, the RMV office at um in chinatown if you know where that is um right right now the old rmv building i think they they decamped from that building but but yes there's there's like a big uh there's big marker on that building itself too which you can can stand there and look at um 
in uh, 2015, when I was working on the 250th anniversary of the Stamp Act protest that gave birth to the Liberty Tree, um, I got very obsessed with uh, with the story of the marking of the place. And I actually found a photograph, um, which I think I still have somewhere, of uh, a marker that was in the basement of that building when it still had just a dirt floor in the basement. They Somebody had actually put like a cobble marker, like the marker we have today for the marking where the Boston massacre happened. And then they built the building on top of it. <laughs> um, but I have no idea if that, if that marker still survives, but, um, but yes, the, the Liberty tree has had a number of markers over time. Um, and which I think just reminds us of, how important it has been to uh, to our our memory in Boston of the power of protest, for sure. Um, uh, Casey, coming back to you, um, one of our audience members asked um, if you might comment further on the rise of intentionally provocative political violence really within recent political movements on both the left and the right um, and and what impact that might have on our political discourse moving forward I mean th this is certainly something that we've we've seen in in past periods of American history the, the the classic example of this of course is the reconstruction era where we get the imposition of of Jim Crow you know laws passed in the mostly in the uh, 18 late 1880s or early 1890s to establish a caste system in the uh, in the south but ones where where they sort of formalized uh, a situation that already had existed as a result of organized terroristic political violence uh, in uh, in the south from organizations like the Ku Klux Klan and similar paramilitary uh, organizations. Then we see sort of another surge of, uh, of, of, of radical violent protest in the late 60s and early 70s. Think of movements like the Weathermen or the SLA, um, the, this kind of odd terroristic activity that largely dies out in the uh, in the late 70s. What's different, I think, um, and obviously, you know, one of the benefits of history is that uh, we can speak more easily with perspective about events that were 50 or 100 years ago than events that are 50 or 100 days ago, um, is that the, the current wave of political violence, and obviously January 6th is, is sort of in a class by itself here, but we've seen, you know, comparable uh, episodes, you know, the, the, the attempt to, to, to assassinate Governor Whitmer in uh, in Michigan, some of the really ugly examples of Antifa protest on the left in Portland, uh, Oregon, and, and Seattle, th they seem to be closer to the political mainstream uh, than certainly groups like the Weathermen or, or, or SLA um, uh, does. And you know, whether that's a result of, of a political culture in which um, you know, threats of violence seem to be routine, whether it's a result of social media, or whether it's this kind of temporary blip like the 70s violence that will then go away, I think is the big unanswered question for um, for this aspect of American politics over the next decade or so. But it's 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 notable and it's unusual. Thank you. Um, we are almost out of time here. So I am actually going to exercise my, my prerogative as host and ask one final comment before I um, before I uh, close things down for the evening. And um, I really wanted to come back to Lori's comment about the red and white bars, perhaps reflecting um, the British flag. And, um, and it's a useful reminder that at the time of the Stamp Act protest, of course, Bostonians counted themselves mostly quite proudly um, as British subjects. They were not yet thinking of themselves as Americans and there was no American constitution. Um, uh, and I, you know, I am thinking about um, a, a, an argument put forward by uh, Barbara Clark Smith, who is a fabulous curator at the National Museum of American History in a book she published several years ago called The Freedoms We Lost. And she argues there um, that uh, within the British political framework um, in the 18th century, um, protest had a different valence than it does uh, within the frame of the United States Constitution in that the laws were passed by parliament and parliament claimed to be sovereign uh, and protest was in effect the withholding of consent 
after the fact from laws passed by this sovereign entity. Um, under the US constitution, uh, the people are sovereign, right? We, the people, uh, are um, are making the laws and protest against the sovereignty of the will of the majority becomes quite problematic and makes protest harder uh, to legitimize. Do you think that there's merit in that idea, Casey? Does that, um, do we see that when we look at the tradition of protest after the founding of the nation? I, I, I think that that it it complicates the nature of uh, of what constitutes effective protest in the United States, and this has been reflected in a couple of the questions as as well. That that protests that are perceived as as sort of as directly challenging, uh, you know, the the existing majority often have to tread on on careful on careful grounds. And I think there's another aspect of of, of protest which which differ, which separates the U.S. from uh, from Britain, in that the nature of the federalist system means that oftentimes you can be protesting, you know, a local decision that might be different from a national decision. And so the question is, what specific government policies are are you protesting? So there there are different differences in, in in this respect you know it's 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 ripped from the headlines here but i've been thinking about the the protests in the last several weeks in israel um where we've seen just extraordinary protests against the judicial you know quote unquote reform uh package there and the critics of that uh of of these protests have have raised that some of the points that you're making here which is that these these protests can be can be seen as an assault on the foundation of the Israeli state, and so this is an issue that I think that is inherent in political protest. You know, period. Fantastic. Well, um, I'm sad to say we've reached the end of our time here today. Um, so, uh, Lori, Casey, thank you so much. This was fantastic, um, and I think it's just the beginning of an arc of dialogue that we hope to have throughout this year as we explore the legacies of the Boston Tea Party and the place of protest in American politics and, and life. So um, huge opportunity to connect past and present in meaningful ways moving forward. And thank you both so much for helping us get it started with tonight's program. Um, and a big thank you to, to all of you in our audience for participating with us today. I, I really hope that you enjoyed our panel this evening, and I hope that you'll come back and join us again soon. We have so much coming up throughout the year from new exhibits, panels, and author talks to plays and even a protest music festival slated for the fall. Um, to, please, to learn more, please um, visit our website, which is revolutionaryspaces.org. You can sign up for our newsletter there. You can see recordings of earlier programs. Um, you can explore our collections. We have uh, a great interface to allow you to see what else is in our collection. Um, there are all kinds of treasures like the Liberty Tree flag that are just waiting to be discovered. Um, and if you are not already doing so, I hope that you will follow Revolutionary Spaces on all of your favorite social media platforms. So thank you again to our panelists. Thank you for our partners at uh, GBH Forum Network and at Ford Hall Forum um, and to the Lowell Institute for making tonight's program possible. And uh, um, thanks to you for being with us and have a wonderful night.